2019 has been an eventful year in the world of cars and motorsport. We've seen new releases, technical advances have been made, records have been broken, and sadly we've said goodbye to some of our heroes. It's been a significant 12 months, but how much do you really remember? It's time to find out. This is the Great Car Quiz of 2019. Some questions may be easy for you, some may be quite tricky. So if you fancy, keep a note of your score and let me know how you got on at the end of the video. Just a quick note, in the interest of keeping the video moving, I've set a 5 second timer before I reveal the answer to each question. But please do feel free to pause the video if you fancy a bit more time to think before I reveal the answer. Right, here we go. Let's start with some of the new cars of 2019. Electric powered cars have been a consistent topic throughout the year, with large manufacturers and brands such as Ford, Cadillac and Porsche unveiling their first attempts at EVs. When the Porsche Taycan 4S, Taycan Turbo and Taycan Turbo S were unveiled, it was immediately met with outrage from many Porsche purists due to one glaring oddity. But what was that oddity? Was it that A. The car had a range of less than 150 miles B. It no longer has the classic Porsche badge C. The Turbo and Turbo S don't actually have any turbos or D. The Tycon speaker system makes a synthetic combustion engine roar in the cabin whenever you start the car. The answer is C. Considering the fact that the car uses a pair of electric motors rather than an internal combustion engine, and therefore the forced induction provided from a turbocharger is not applicable, both fans and foes of the new Porsche were left wondering why exactly the car was given the turbo moniker. The Taycan was by no means the only electric sports car to be unveiled in 2019, as back in March, Pininfarina took the covers of their fully electric, 1,900 brake horsepower Batista hypercar. The excitingly shaped car was in part able to be produced as a result of Pininfarina ending relationships with some extremely long-standing automotive clients for whom they have been designing cars for many years. But which of these cars is not designed by the design house Pininfarina? Is it A, the Peugeot 406 Coupe, B, the Bentley Azure, C, the Daewoo Takuma, or D, the Ferrari 812 Superfast. The answer is the Ferrari. When the 812 Superfast was launched back in 2017, it replaced the F12 and also marked the end of an era, as once the F12 was pulled from production, Ferrari no longer sold a car that was designed by Pininfarina, something that hadn't been the case for over 65 years. Fortunately, this gave the Italian design house the chance to move on to even faster things. We got our fair share of smaller electric cars in 2019 too, and one of the most exciting to be unveiled was the Honda e City car. Honda received praise for taking into production a car that appeared so very similar to the high-tech laden prototype they had teased and tempted us with in the years beforehand. But which low-tech, staple, automotive feature was omitted from both the prototype and the production Honda e? Was it A. A brake pedal B. Wing mirrors C. Interior door handles or D. Window wipers The answer is wing mirrors. Journalists and customers alike were surprised and impressed when Honda opted to use cameras on the side of the Honda e that fed images to dedicated screens on each end of the car's dashboard in replacing the traditional and further protruding glass wing mirrors. In 2019, we also got big electric cars. Really big electric cars. Well, actually, electric trucks. 
In November, Tesla unveiled the immediately infamous Cybertruck, a vehicle that has some truly impressive stats and had a less than impressive window strength demonstration. Which outrageous optional extra was it announced that the Cybertruck could be specced with when it goes on sale? Was it A, an electric quad bike? B, a traffic and cattle spotting drone? C, tank tread, also known as continuous track? Or D, a glove compartment defibrillator? The answer is A, the electric quad bike, or as Tesla have called it, the cyber quad. This ATV will be available exclusively as an optional add-on for customers to purchase when ordering their Cybertruck, and it can be stored on and charged by the Tesla pickup. In July, the electric car world heated up a little when Lotus unveiled their Revia hypercar producing an incredible 2000 PS and with an F1 style drag reduction system, the car promises to be the pinnacle of performance and technology. Therefore, it was quite a surprise when the design director of Lotus, Russell Carr, announced that the shape and surface of the state-of-the-art machine was inspired by which unexpected piece of nature? Was it A, the blue whale, B, the aurora borealis, aka the Northern Lights, C, Frog's Legs, or D, Rocks. Oddly, the answer is Rocks. Mr. Carr is quoted as saying that the design team spent many hours studying images of geological forms and rocks that have been carved by nature before capturing their lines in the Avaya making this Lotus the most high-tech rock I've certainly ever seen. Despite this plethora of exciting electrical cars arriving in the automotive world throughout 2019, the internal combustion engine had an equally stirring year. British sports car manufacturer Morgan caused great controversy this year when they unveiled their brand new Plus 6 Roadster. Whilst the Roadster's frame remained charmingly vintage and made from ash wood, as is traditional, a significant component change on the Plus 6 threw into question the car's validity as a true retro driver's car for many onlookers. What was that infamous change? Was it A, the car was given a hybrid powertrain? B, the car was only available with an automatic transmission? C, the Plus 6 was given traction control, the first Morgan to have so, or D, the large front grille is a fake and is actually filled with plastic for aero efficiency. The answer, I'm sad to say, is that the car is only available to purchase with an automatic transmission. This is because the new Plus 6 uses the same BMW turbocharged inline six-cylinder engine as the latest Z4 and the Mark V Toyota Supra, which unfortunately is exclusively mated to an automatic BMW gearbox. One of the year's best manual gearboxes can be found on none other than the humble Mazda MX-5 ND. Mazda in 2019 have celebrated the truly bragworthy 30th anniversary of the Mazda MX-5 being in production. To acknowledge this milestone, Mazda produced the suitably named Mazda MX-5 30th Anniversary Edition, a car that Mazda says celebrates 30 years of dedication to their engineering philosophy, Jinba Itai. But what does the Japanese term Jinba Itai translate to in English? Is it A. Speed and decisiveness B. The saddled dragon C. Fun not fast Or D. Horse and rider The answer is horse and rider. Jinba Itai refers to the feeling of oneness there should be between a horse and its rider. Mazda adopted this Japanese tradition and uses it as a requirement for each MX-5 they make, requiring there to be a connection and feeling of unity between the driver and their car. In March, 
Bugatti unveiled La Voiture Noire and it immediately broke records as the world's most expensive new car with a price tag of 11 million euros before tax. The car is the pinnacle of power, presence and, dare I say, excess. But which of the following is not a real feature on Le Voiture Noir? A. A line of six exhausts at the rear of the car. B. Tires painted to make the wheels look even bigger. C. An outer skin on the wheels that spins separately to the rest of the wheel. Or D. A chrome dorsal fin running along the center of the car from nose to tail. The only of those features not to be real on Le Voiture Noir are the spinning rims. Whilst the wheels on the car are two-tone and two-layered, with silver spokes on display on the outside and black structural supports hidden behind, thankfully these layers don't spin separately to each other or the rest of the wheel. Rather amazingly though, Bugatti did opt to paint the car's tyres in places to match the silver spokes of the wheels and make them look even bigger. It was a big year for Lamborghini too, as they unveiled not only the Huracan Evo in January, but in September they showcased the Lamborghini Shan at the Frankfurt Motor Show. It was the Italian company's first ever hybrid powered car. However, something about its powertrain makes it different from other hybrid hypercars. Is it that A. It doesn't technically have a battery B. It uses liquid nitrogen to cool the battery C. The electric motor only kicks in at over 70 miles per hour Or D. The electric motors are actually in the front wheel hubs behind the brake discs The hybrid Lamborghini Shan doesn't technically have a battery, but instead uses a supercapacitor. This alternative energy storage solution is a first for a hybrid supercar and allows for a much quicker dispensing of energy than a regular lithium-ion car battery. However, the Lamborghini's hybrid system only actually produces a modest 34 extra horsepower. 2019 saw Audi unveiling their new and much anticipated RS6 Avant, which for the first time is available for the US market. Audi have been producing supercar thrashing wagons for over 25 years, and their first, the 1994 RS2 Avant, was a mighty statement of intent. The car was famously a collaborative effort between Audi and Porsche, with Porsche adding to the estate car a number of components from their own high-performance lineup. But which Porsche car donated its components to give the Audi RS2 Avant a performance edge in the braking department? Was it A, the Porsche 911 964? B, the Porsche 928S? C, the Porsche 968 Club Sport? Or D, the Porsche 911 964 RSR. The answer is the Porsche 968 Club Sport. In fact, Porsche took the brake calipers, wheels and tyres from their hardcore and capable front-engined 968 and donated them all to the Audi RS2 Avant. And as the wagon was actually built by Porsche in the same factory they made the 959 supercar, it really is about as much a Porsche as it is an Audi. The 2020 Audi RS6 may be all Audi, but it still serves a size-defying punch, with its 592 brake horsepower engine giving the estate car supercar levels of performance. But if it were to line up at a drag strip and race a McLaren F1, a 2007 Audi R8, a 2019 Porsche 911 992, and a Bugatti Chiron from 0 to 60 miles per hour, in what position would it finish? A. First. B. Second. C. 
third, D fourth, or E fifth? The Audi RS6 Avant would reach the finishing point in third place with an impressive 0 to 60 time of 3.6 seconds. Understandably, this two ton wagon can't match the likes of the Bugatti's time of 2.4 seconds or the McLaren F1's time of 3.2 seconds. However, it does beat its supercar sibling, the Audi R8, well, the 2007 car at least to 60 miles per hour by an entire second and it will even out sprint a brand new Porsche 911 Carrera to 60 miles per hour by 6 tenths of a second. Impressive stuff. Right, it's time to talk Toyota Supra. In January, we saw the return of one of the most eagerly anticipated cars of the decade. And whilst its reception was mixed, it certainly has remained a talking point over the year. My question is, which ex-Formula 1 driver helped Toyota by driving their Supra onto the stage at the launch event in Detroit? Was it A. Jensen Button B. Fernando Alonso C. Kamui Kobayashi or D. Ralph Schumacher. It was none other than Mr. Fernando Alonso. Just a couple of months after retiring from Formula One, Alonso crept the Toyota Supra onto stage at the car's unveiling. No doubt an obligation of his contract with Toyota, whom he has achieved his second successive Le Mans victory with this year. In September, we finally got to see the long-awaited new Land Rover Defender. Aesthetically, it remained true to the generations of utilitarian Land Rovers that preceded it, and it appears engineered to retain the off-road capabilities of the prior generation 4x4 too. But it is certainly more high-tech. In fact, it is incredibly high-tech. Which one of the following ludicrous optional extras is speckable on the new Land Rover Defender? Is it A, a self-drive feature that can herd farm animals? B, heart rate monitors in the steering wheel? C, a self-healing outer skin? Or D, a water filtration system that turns dirty or even seawater drinkable and chilled? Very handily, it's the self-healing skin. Whilst it sounds like something out of a sci-fi film, you can choose to have your new Defender delivered with a paint protection film that not only protects the car's paint, but if it is damaged, will actually close up and heal any small scratches or grazes on the wrap if it is sat in the warmth for a few minutes. Much more useful for those city-dwelling Defenders than an auto sheep herd feature. Almost equally amazingly, given the Defender is so modern and high-tech with a whopping 85 computers on board, Land Rover is also offering their most advanced creation with a positively archaic optional extra. Is that option A. Steel wheels to replace the standard alloys B. Wooden bench seating in the back C. A no heater, no air conditioning, no electric windows option or D. James May. It's the steel wheels. In what seems like an exercise in reverse psychology, purchasers can choose to forgo alloy wheels and instead opt for an old school steel set. In actual fact, these steel wheels are tougher and offer a larger tyre wall than the aluminium variants, making them better for tough off-roading. Above all else, 2019 may well have been the year of the SUV. Whether you love them or loathe them, there's no denying, they're here to stay. And therefore, everyone is trying to get on the bandwagon. Aston Martin have now joined the SUV party, with the launch of the DBX. The car looks like an Aston, boasts some exotic performance stats, and will cost supercar money. It also, however, was designed and engineered to be practical too, with one test being to see how the DBX would cope if it were to tow a trailer with a rather special payload on it. 
Now, what was that special payload? Was it A, a Red Bull Formula One car? B, a life-size model African elephant? C, the Aston Martin AM37 powerboat? Or D, a 1960s Aston Martin DB6? The answer is the 1960s Aston Martin DB6. Aston Martin's engineering team used computer analysis to see just how well the DBX would perform aerodynamically if it were to tow a DB6. To be fair, given the cost of the DBX, I imagine a £400,000 vintage car is as likely a payload as a caravan for the new SUV. One of the most exciting and unexpected automotive reveals of the year came in June and in the form of a sketch. Gordon Murray's T50 Hypercar, aka the true successor to the McLaren F1. In order to try and meet the ever-building expectations for this car, Mr. Murray is developing the T50's aerodynamics with the help of a Formula One team. Is that Formula One team A, McLaren, B, Racing Point, C, Williams, or D, Mercedes? Rather surprisingly, the answer is not McLaren, but the Racing Point F1 team, who are lending Mr. Murray and his team their moving floor wind tunnel, as well as the knowledge of their F1 technicians. The T50 has three seats, a 12,400 RPM V12 engine, and most incredibly of all, a giant fan on the back which sucks the hypercar into the floor. This feature is fully inspired by Gordon Murray's design of the 1978 Brabham BT46B Formula One car, whose massive fan, driven by the engine, created so much ground effect that the car was the fastest on the grid by far. Over the 1978 Formula One season, there were 16 races, but how many of those 16 races did the blisteringly quick fan car win? Was it A, one race, B, five races, C, nine races, or D, 14 races? One race, just one. Nicky Lauda piloted the Brabham BT46B to victory in the only race it entered. After Brabham's dominant victory, its rival teams were so angry about this new, innovative car being so much faster than their own, they threatened to leave the Formula One Constructors Association unless Bernie Eccleston, the Brabham team boss and chief executive of the Formula One Constructors Association, withdrew the fan car from competition immediately and reverted back to a traditional setup. Right, it's time to mix things up. I've gotten busy on Photoshop and made the following image, which is comprised of three different supercars, all unveiled in 2019. Can you name all three cars in 10 seconds? Each correctly identified car is worth one point. Here's a hint for the first three in one. Not all of these cars have been available to take home in 2019. Right, here you go. Okay, so starting at the rear of the car, we've got the first ever mid-engined Chevrolet Corvette, unveiled this year and due for deliveries to begin in 2020. Then, in green, we've got the highly rated Lamborghini Huracan Evo Spider, unveiled in February. And at the very front of the three-in-one is the McLaren GT, launched in May. Here's another three-in-one for you to identify. Quick hint. One's electric, one's French, and one has a 5-litre V8 engine. Right, so at the front of the car, we have the French Alpina A110S, launched in August. 
This lightweight sports car sits as a stiffer, more hardcore alternative to the still available A110. In the middle, we have the electric Aston Martin Rapide E, a car with 612 PS and a sub 4 seconds 0 to 60 time, launched back in April. And bringing up the rear is the Lexus RCF Track Edition. Unveiled in January, the RCF and RCF Track Edition sports a 472 brake horsepower V8 engine and has a style inspired by Lexus's GT3 race cars. And here's the final three in one. One third English, one third American and one third German. The English front end of the car is comprised of the 2020 Bentley Flying Spur, a car as fast as it is luxurious, with a 0-60 to 60 time of 3.7 seconds and an immense top speed of 207 miles per hour. The American third is a car with even more speed, the 2020 Ford Mustang Shelby GT500, a car with 760 horsepower, a 0 to 60 time of 3.3 seconds, and will cover the quarter mile from a standstill in just 10.7 seconds. At the back is the latest speed demon from Germany, the BMW M8 Grand Coupe, going one better than even the Mustang with a 0 to 60 time of 3.2 seconds, even with considerably less power at 625 horses. 2019 has been a significant year for Coenzeg. The Swedish supercar slash hypercar slash megacar company celebrated their 25th anniversary and did so by unveiling a brand new car with a brand new engine and an incredibly clever and complicated gearbox. This transmission system has nine gears, but just how many clutches does the new Coenzeg Jesko have? Is it A, zero, B, four, C, seven, or D, ten clutches? The answer is C, seven clutches. Why so many? By having seven clutches, it means that every one of the car's forward gears is prepped, spinning, and ready should it be selected. You see, a dual clutch transmission allows for fast gear changes by trying to predict which gear the driver is going to use next, and then pre-selecting and preparing that gear for the change. However, if the driver chooses a different gear to what the car predicted, for example, they may choose to change down gear when the computer expects them to shift up, the gear below won't be ready and the car will lose a little momentum. In the Jesco, there's no more getting it wrong because every gear is ready all the time, allowing for light speed gear changes in every scenario, something we truly haven't seen before 2019. Right, let's move on to records as 2019 has seen a number of records broken and set. But for the moment, let's stick with Coenzeg, as in September, in their Regera Mega Car, they broke the record for the fastest ever time going between 0 and 400 km per hour and then back to 0 in a time of 31.49 seconds. The previous record, which they broke, was for a time of 33.29 seconds. But which car company held that prior record time? Was it A, Bugatti, B, SSC, C, Hennessy, or D, Coenzeg? It was actually Coenzeg. They broke their own records that had been set in 2017 with an Agera RS. It seems the Swedish company are set on going faster and faster, even when they're already the fastest. September was a good month for going fast, as whilst Cohen's eggs were going 400 km per hour, Bugatti's were driving at almost 500 km per hour. It was the moment we had been waiting for. A hypercar had accelerated to over 300 miles per hour. 
However, as the dust settled from the headlines and everyone had a chance to read the small print, we noticed that the coveted production car top speed record remained unbroken. My question to you is, why was this? Was it A, the Bugatti broke down and was unable to complete its second confirmation run? B, the Bugatti had some aerodynamic modifications and was almost a foot longer than the production car? C, the car had to use an aero shield provided by another Bugatti driving ahead of it up to 250 miles per hour in order to save enough fuel for the top speed run? Or was it D, Bugatti didn't expect to break the record, so didn't bother to invite any official who'd be able to certify the top speed run? The answer is because the Bugatti Chiron that set the 490.484 km per hour top speed had a number of modifications to get it over the 300 miles per hour hurdle. It was given a long tail, extending the length of the car by 25 centimeters. It had a more aero efficient front bumper and also had a longer final gear and an extra 100 horsepower, plus a roll cage and six point harness for the driver. As a result, the car was considered a concept or prototype rather than a production model. And the record remains with the Coenzeg Agera RS at a speed of 277.9 miles per hour. Bugatti have announced that they are producing the Bugatti Chiron Supersport 300 Plus, a production variant of the Chiron which, like the concept, will be able to exceed 300 miles per hour. So it seems now the race really is on to set an above 300 miles per hour production car speed record. 2020 may be the year. 2019 was certainly a good year for motorsport, with action thrilling us from Peru to the Porsche curves at Le Mans. The Dakar rally this year was won for the first time by Toyota, after being on the podium five times in the last seven years prior. The Dakar rally is considered to be the most gruelling motorsport event on the planet, with entrants having to drive thousands of miles across barren desert in the pursuit of glory. However, is it true or false that over the 10 days participants were competing in the 2019 Dakar Rally, they raced more miles than the World Rally Championship did over its 10 month long season this year? That statement is false. Whilst in just 10 days, the 2019 Dakar Rally drivers raced over an impressive distance of 1,834 miles, this does come short of the 2,598 miles through which those participating in the World Rally Championship competed. With that being said, the 2020 Dakar Rally, with its 3,107 mile long competitive course, does look set to eclipse the World Rally Championship in terms of distance covered. The dust and dirt of rally racing could hardly be further from the clean glitz and glamour of the Formula One circus. However, the 2019 season certainly had its fair share of gritty situations too. A highlight being the rain-soaked German Grand Prix in Hockenheim. Tricky conditions caused almost every driver to end up off the track at one point or another, with six drivers failing to make it to the finish line altogether. How many points did the now six-time world champions, Mercedes F1 team, gain from their home German Grand Prix? Was it A, zero points, B, two points, C, 14 points, or D, 23 points? The answer is two points. Despite only Lewis Hamilton finishing for Mercedes after Valtteri Bottas crashed out, and despite Hamilton reaching the chequered flag in 11th place, one place outside of the points, due to both Alfa Romeo cars being handed a 30 second time penalty after the race, he was promoted to 9th place and inside the points. 2019 has finally seen the McLaren Formula 1 team begin to bounce back from its woeful 5 year slump, with Carlos Sainz achieving his first ever Formula 1 top 3 finish, and the team's first top 3 finish since 2014. 
But who did Carlos Sainz share his podium with at that eventful Brazilian Grand Prix? Was it A. Max Verstappen and Pierre Gasly? B. Lewis Hamilton and Alexander Albon? C. Max Verstappen and Lewis Hamilton? Or D. His McLaren teammates? Carlos Sainz shared his first ever podium in Formula 1 with all of his McLaren teammates. Due to an incident during the final stages of the race, Lewis Hamilton was demoted from 3rd place to 7th. However, this decision wasn't made hurriedly, and by the time the race stewards had decided Hamilton deserved a 5 second penalty, demoting him from the podium positions, the trophy awarding ceremony had already finished. Therefore, Carlos Sainz, once he was promoted from 4th to 3rd place, instead took to the now abandoned podium to celebrate his 3rd place with all the McLaren team joining him up there. It wasn't a season of all highs though. There were also a number of low points, with the motorsport community mourning the passing of Formula 1's long-standing race director Charlie Whiting, Formula 1 driving legend and Mercedes GP figurehead Nicky Lauda, and the tragic loss of one of motorsport's upcoming stars, Antoine Hubert. Three men, all driven by their love for motorsport, who will be greatly missed. One of the most important changes in motorsport in the last few decades has been the emphasis on safety. And whilst motorsport will never likely be completely safe, recent developments such as the Halo device in Formula 1, 2, 3 and E have further upped the standards of safety in single-seater sports. The Halo was chosen over the alternative Red Bull Aero screen in 2017 by the FIA as the optimal single-seater head protection device. However, which single-seater racing series has this year announced that they will be using the Red Bull Aero screen as of 2020? Is it A. The W Series B. IndyCar C. Formula 4 or D. Super Formula The answer is IndyCar, with Red Bull reporting the aero screen is actually now stronger than the Halo, the Elite American single-seater series has opted to make the device mandatory for the 2020 season. Whilst the device was quickly met with complaints regarding how it will affect the aesthetics of the car, given the lives that have likely already been saved by the Halo device, fitting the aero screen is an easy choice to make. 2019 also saw the inaugural season of the W Series, an all-female racing series aimed at giving women more opportunities in single-seater racing. The season offered some incredible and close racing, which was in part as a result of the organizer's decision to make every car on the grid identical, meaning no technical advantages could be had. But how did the W Series go a step even further to ensure the playing field was level between all competitors? Did they A. Have every competitor swap cars, data and even engineers before each race weekend? B. Send a test driver out to test drive every car on the grid before every race weekend? C. Assign each competitor a personal trainer for the season and prohibit them from receiving any other outside counsel, or D, alternate between the grid racing Formula 3 and Formula 2 spec cars on each race weekend. Impressively, in order to maintain a completely level playing field, competitors had to swap cars, data and even engineers between every race weekend. So throughout the season, everyone competes in a different car each weekend and has the insight of a different engineer each weekend too. And it did make for some truly excellent racing. Right, we've spoken about new releases, we've spoken about recent motorsport events, but 2019 was also a bumper year for the classic cars, as over the last 12 months, there have been many very significant birthdays. 
Having already referred to the Mazda MX-5's 30th anniversary this year, our first happy birthday goes to the Rolls-Royce Phantom 5 which turned 60 years old in 2019. It was the pinnacle of refined luxury at the time and was the vehicle of choice for royalty, politicians and dignitaries. Perhaps the most famous Rolls-Royce Phantom of all is this. Fashioned in a very custom paint job with even painted wheels, it was undoubtedly the loudest looking roller to hit the road and possibly still is. The question is, who owns this unique car? Was it A, Audrey Hepburn, B, Elvis Presley, C, John Lennon, or D, Jimi Hendrix? This Rolls Royce belonged to John Lennon. Apparently, one day when the Beatles band member was driving his car through London, his Rolls was attacked by a woman outraged at its paint do. She, whilst hitting his Phantom with an umbrella, screamed at him, You swine! How dare you do that to a Rolls Royce? The Rolls Royce turned 60 in 2019 with another piece of automotive royalty one of the most famous cars of all time, the classic Mini. Unlike the Phantom 5, the Mini was made to be a car everyone could own, and seemingly it was, as over the 41 years the classic Mini was in production, over 6 million units of the car were sold when considering all the variants and different brand names it was sold under across the globe. Of course, the main reason for this was its affordability. So, when the Mini was first launched in 1959, how much could you pick one up for? A. £352 B. £496 C. £844 or D. £1010 In 1959, £496 would get you a brand new Morris Mini Minor or Austin 7 as they were then called. And that included the car's £146 purchase tax. Oh how times have changed. 10 years after the launch of the Mini and celebrating its 50th birthday this year came the unusual and all too often forgotten about Porsche 914. Made to replace the most affordable car in Porsche's lineup, the 912, the 914 was designed to be cheap, reliable, and widely available. So Porsche opted to collaborate with a manufacturer experienced in creating more affordable, widely available cars. Now, was that manufacturer A. Volkswagen, B. Ford, C. Toyota, or D. Audi. It was Volkswagen. Whilst the car was designed by Porsche, the majority of the 914 models use Volkswagen's flat 4 engines taken from their Type 4 sedan. In Europe, the 914 was even sold as a VW Porsche, with a special collaborative badge on the back replacing the two manufacturers' regular individual badges. In the USA, however, where around 80% of all the 914s produced were sold, the car was branded as a Porsche and as a Porsche alone. It's not just cars that have reached significant milestones in 2019. Car companies have too. This year, Bentley turned a century old, and over those 100 years, they have made some great cars. They have also made a few stinkers, but now's not the time for that. One of the company's most famous historical cars is known as the Blower Bentley, and it's a car that quickly got itself quite the reputation when it was produced in 1929 and used in competition. But why did this 4.5 litre, 2 ton car get the nickname Blower Bentley? Was it A, because it had an enormous backfiring exhaust? Was it B, because its engine would regularly blow up? Was it C, because it was so loud, apparently it would shatter windows as it drove past houses, like an explosion? 
Or was it D, because it's had a supercharger? The car was famously known as the blower Bentley because it had a supercharger blowing air into the engine. Mind you, the car did quickly get quite a reputation for breaking down during competition. Over in France, Citroën have been celebrating their centenary too. Citroën are a manufacturer who have always had a penchant for innovation, using out-of-the-box thinking to benefit those looking for practicality and those looking for luxury. The French manufacturer surprised the world when, in 1955, they unveiled the DS, a car filled to the brim with innovative and unconventional features. Most famously of all was the DS's hydropneumatic self-leveling suspension, which offered magic carpet-like levels of comfort, plus would allow the car to mechanically lift a wheel up into the air so that the wheel could be changed should you have a flat tyre. Or, if you don't have a spare tyre with you, you could simply continue your journey driving on just three wheels. But there's another feature on the car which is equally unusual and unnerving. Is it A, clear driver and passenger footwells, B, a button rather than a brake pedal, C, an emergency brake lever in the passenger glove box, or D, a rudimentary auto steer feature? As unusual and unnerving as a 1950s autopilot feature would be, the correct answer is a button rather than a brake pedal. Like a brake pedal, the button was still operated by the driver's foot. However, rather than the severity of the car's braking being dictated by how far the button travels, as is the case with a regular brake pedal, the high pressure system on the DS meant the severity of the car's braking depends on how hard you hit the brake button. In the Citroen DS, if you want to brake hard, you mash the brake button with your foot and it immediately goes into full power braking. I imagine you can quite easily spot inexperienced Citroen DS drivers when they're on the road. In the same country, 20 years before Citroen opened their doors for the first time, a little motor company called Renault was setting up shop. Now in their 120th year, the manufacturer is an industry behemoth, owning brands such as Nissan and Dacia. Despite clearly being damn good when it comes to the business of making money, the French manufacturer has also been known to make some downright silly cars too. Back in 1995, Renault made this. Never sold, of course, but this Renault Espace was given a carbon fiber reinforced body, a huge spoiler, carbon disc brakes and four carbon bucket seats, the rear two of which are sat either side of the van's engine. But from which car did Renault source this ridiculous MPV's engine? Was it from A, the 1995 Nissan Skyline R33 GT1 Le Mans, B, the 1995 Renault Clio Williams Maxi Rally car, C, the 1994 Renault Laguna Touring Car, or D, the 1993 Williams FW14 Formula One Car. This very special Renault Espace got its engine from the 1993 Williams FW14 Formula One Car, which is why this one-off Super MPV was actually named the Espace F1. This engine gave the People Carrier 800 brake horsepower and would rev beyond 13,000 RPM. It would send the van to 62 miles per hour in just 2.8 seconds and would accelerate all the way to 194 miles per hour. Just perfect if you're running late for the school run. Finally, there's Fiat. Another industry titan who, in 2019, also celebrated their 120th birthday. Fiat have now been a cornerstone of great Italian automotive design for 12 decades and have produced shapes that are recognised the world over and will go down as some of the all-time greats. 
but one of the Italian manufacturer's most beautiful cars is not particularly well known, or at least has always lived in a shadow. It's this, the Fiat Dino. My question is, who is the Fiat Dino named after? Is it A, Dante Giacosa, the designer of the Fiat 500? B, Gian Paolo De Lara, a famous Italian auto engineer? C, Alfredo Ferrari, the son of Ferrari founder Enzo Ferrari? Or D, Carlo Abarth, the founder of Abarth Cars? The Fiat Dino is named after Alfredo Ferrari, who was affectionately nicknamed Dino. It shares the name with the far more famous Ferrari Dino, because they both share the same V6 engine that was produced in part by Alfredo Dino Ferrari, who sadly died in 1956. When completed after Alfredo's passing, the engine was named the Dino in his honour. And that is where both the identically engined Ferrari and Fiat get their name from. So that was 35 questions of varying difficulties. And now, here comes the final five. For those of you who have found it all too easy thus far, this is the impossible round. To get these answers right, you'll have to have the precision of a Porsche 919 and the processing power of a Robo race car. So, good luck. In 2019, the Bloodhound Land Speed record team continued to build up and develop their jet and rocket powered car with the ambition of it breaking the land speed record in the coming years. Currently, it's a way off, with its fastest run in 2019 reaching 628 miles per hour. But do you know how far off it is from breaking the record? What is the current land speed record to three decimal places? Is it A, 735.993 miles per hour? B, 761.143 miles per hour? C, 761.892 miles per hour? or D, 763.035 miles per hour. The answer is D, 763.035 miles per hour, set by the Thrust SSC in October of 1997. The car, powered by two Rolls-Royce jet engines, was the first land vehicle to ever break the sound barrier. The Bloodhound team is looking for their car to exceed 1,000 miles per hour in the future. This year, we saw the launch of the Ferrari Roma, a beautiful V8-powered GT car for those who want a little less flair from their Ferrari. It came towards the end of a hectic year for the Italian brand, during which they have unveiled how many different new production models to the market? A, three cars, B, four cars, C, five cars, or D, six cars? The answer is C. Ferrari have launched five new production models in 2019. In March, they unveiled the F8 Tributo, followed by the SF90 Stradale in May. Then in September, they unveiled the F8 Spider and 812 GTS convertibles. And then last of all in November came the Roma. Unfortunately, Ferrari have already announced that they won't be unveiling the same number of cars in 2020. In mid-December, Honda announced the return of the S2000. Well, sort of. In celebration of the fact that the S2000 turned 20 this year, the Japanese mark will be displaying a tweaked S2000 at the Tokyo Auto Salon in January 2020. The changes will include a revised front bumper, uprated suspension, and an up-to-date audio setup. The engine, it seems, will remain untouched. A pretty good idea, I think, as it's still considered a mechanical marvel to this day. 
For 10 years, the Japanese domestic market Honda S2000's 2.0-litre engine held the record as the naturally aspirated engine with the most horsepower per litre of displacement. But exactly what was the Japanese domestic market Honda S2000 F20C's horsepower per litre figure? Was it A. 115.8 brake horsepower per litre B. 118.5 brake horsepower per litre Was it C. 121.1 brake horsepower per litre Or was it D. 123.7 brake horsepower per litre The answer is D. 123.7 brake horsepower per litre. This makes the JDM Honda S2000 more powerful per litre of engine displacement than the Lamborghini Aventador SVJ and even the Audi R8 V10 Plus. The S2000's engine was only dethroned when in 2010 Ferrari launched the 458 with its 124.8 brake horsepower per litre V8 engine. December also saw the end of the 2019 Formula 1 season. A season, it is fair to say, was dominated by Lewis Hamilton. And despite wrapping up his sixth championship almost a month earlier, at the final race in Abu Dhabi, the Mercedes driver once again dominated the field to take home his 11th win of the season. But how many laps did Lewis Hamilton lead through the 2019 season's 21 races. To help you a little, there were a total of 1,262 laps raced by the F1 grid this year. Did he lead A. 336 of those laps B. 451 laps C. 511 laps or D. 573 laps The answer is C. Lewis Hamilton led 511 laps through the 2019 F1 season. That is 40.5% of all the laps raced throughout the year and puts him just 625 laps behind Michael Schumacher's all-time record of 5,111 laps led in Formula 1. 2019 has brought with it much excitement. Records have been broken, new cars have been unveiled, but as the new comes in, it often means out with the old. And this year we had to wave goodbye to the Volkswagen Beetle, a car that has been in production since 1938 and has provided the entire world of economic travel, being known as the people's car. The original design, penned by Ferdinand Porsche, revolutionized the automotive industry altering perspectives as to who can afford to travel by car. But exactly how many of this original designed car were sold through its 65 years in production? Was it A. 15,411,100 cars B. 17,807,489 cars C. 19,278,999 cars or D. 21,529,464 cars The answer is D. 21,529,000 464 cars, making the Volkswagen Beetle the second highest selling car of all time after the Toyota Corolla, which at 44 million units sold and counting may never be caught. So that was it. We've reached the end of the great car quiz of 2019. I hope you enjoyed this recap of what has been an eventful roller coaster 12 months. And if you kept a note of your quiz scores, please do share with me how you did in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please do consider subscribing to my channel to be kept up to date with my latest creations.
I wish you all the best for 2020, and I look forward to talking more about cars with you then. Thanks.